morning and uh, welcome to this discussion i'm so impressed on a sunday morning i was worried uh, whether anybody would like to come and talk about the budget these days everything happens on real time basis and july budget is already 3 weeks back right so i was very worried about it but then i'm so happy you've taken the trouble to come and i want to thank bic for organizing it and i want to thank dr pani to have Uh, also agreed to be uh, here with me so i'm really thankful to all of you there are certain things in the union budget which i think we all need to recognize and i thought it would be important we discuss this and at bic when i was here at i am bangalore uh, for 6 years we used to have regular annual budget discussions we used to have on the day of the budget strong collective discussion with about 400 students and six panelists at i am on the very day of the budget and then bic used to have it a week or 10 days later and so i was looking forward to this occasion to talk uh, from the heart analytical and also l understand and listen to what is happening um, as far as perceptions of the budget are concerned so when i got this opportunity i really looked forward to it and i said i like to really take this opportunity and talk about it this budget as you will all agree is the first budget of the coalition and that has to be remembered we just can't forget it if you say it's a continuity of the last 10 budgets not really it's a budget of the coalition once you recognize that fact then things become easier to interpret but let me put the budget as an academic professor in the context and i am so happy uh, professor pani also brings in that academic rigor in his talk so i thought instead of just talking and narrating the budget which the fm during the budget speech and in her post budget interviews as well as the way the media intersects it and dissects it so strongly i wasn't really thinking of sharing the figures with you but i thought i'll set it in the context where it is and then of course i'll bring in the figures and then that will be my story on the budget in about 30 minutes and then when it comes to my impressions and discussion about where it is heading i thought in the discussion with professor pani we will take that up so what is actually a budget and i see some some young people here now maybe they'll benefit from it and i understand it's going to go on the youtube so it's more of a pedagogic what is a budget so let me take you back into what is this whole story of macroeconomics as you know in the whole science of macroeconomics we are looking at the end of the day steady growth whatever said and done we want to have a steady path on growth and as we will see during the course of discussion earlier we used to have five year plans so we were thinking of five year growth pattern and then last two years we have been thinking of a 25 year growth pattern so steady growth is the most important thing that one has to think in when it comes to macroeconomics now how do you attain steady growth now that's very important thing as you walk in real life you find all sort of pitfalls and distractions that happen you take admission in a college in a university in a three year degree course and you have all sort of events which are going to distract you from your graduation but you still have to maintain the course you may have monthly exam six monthly annual that keeps you back on to the track so when you talk of steady growth how do you attain steady growth and what is the story of the steady growth as economists we think and we have assigned this task not necessarily this is the best way to do it but we have assigned this task as economists into two different categories one is the fiscal policy which the union or the state or the local body or even as a family we all have budgets so in this context of macroeconomics we think that the government which is an elected representative of ours can tax us and spend on collective requirement 
markets. So that's the fiscal policy. And we think the money supply, the interest rates, something to take care of inflation can be assigned to the central bank of the country, which is the monetary authority, so the monetary policy. Each one of them have a different then sub-objective. Overall objective is steady growth. We need to grow at that path. And these two different streams, fiscal and monetary policy, then are going to aim at different sub-objectives. The key objective of the fiscal policy, and we have heard this a lot in the election and before election and after election, the key objective of the fiscal policy is growth reflected in employment. And as we all know, if number of people in the country are sitting unemployed, obviously growth cannot take place. At the end of the day, growth can only take place if optimal employment is provided, every hand which is willing to work has the job, and there's enough capital to be used to produce something. So in a nutshell, labor and capital bring together output, and that's exactly what the science of macroeconomics says, that the fiscal policy is taking care of the labor, the hands that are available. Of course, it has to take care of the other side, which is money supply, and we'll, link, we'll think through the linkages there. And the monetary authority is going to look at assigned task of inflation, money supply, interest rate. When did this bifurcation really happen? Not too long ago. In 1900, there were only 12 central banks. So the monetary policy aspect assigned to a different authority only happened after 1900, only 12 central banks. Bank of England, of course, came up in 1696. The first bank was, of course, the Swiss Bank, 1656. Indian Central Bank only came up in 1935. The uh, celebrated Fed only came up in 1913. So, therefore, most of the central banks and this task of a monetary policy and this bifurcation that I'm sharing with you is not even 100 years old. But this is where we are today. The fiscal authority takes care of the, uh, what they can do from our pocket, and the monetary authority takes care of the money supply. So the monetary authority will be given charge of inflation control and creating a conducive environment in which the fiscal policy can operate. And the fiscal policy will take care of taxes and expenditure and create a conducive environment in which inflation is under control. So what is the overview of the fiscal policy? So one of the important things that the fiscal policy operates is through taxes and expenditure. And like any young man, expenditure will be much higher than the income. In any young country, emerging country, a developing country, it is obvious that expenditure will be more than their income. For a country, the income is mainly taxes, of course. Once in a while, you may have a massive dividend from the central bank of the country, but that can be only once in a while. It can't happen year after year. It can't happen every day. So basically, there are two instruments through which the government operates. Expenditure, which comes first. And to meet that expenditure, you need to have raised income and which is the taxes. But when in a developing country or emerging country, generally the expenditure is more than the income, the tax, you will have to borrow. The moment you borrow, something new gets kicked in and we'll look at it in a minute from now. So we'll talk about the deficits. So the fiscal policy is operating through the FISC and union budget is actually a reflection of the fiscal policy in the mind of the elected representatives. So to me, a budget is not simply a statement of account, expenditure and income, taxes, but it is far beyond that. And that is exactly what I thought. Of course, the budget is about two and a half, three weeks away. But what is the story behind it? What is the strategy and what's the direction? That needs to be thought through. Earlier, not now, planning commission used to also play a role in distribution of resources and setting priorities and direction where expenditure will take place, but that's not now. 
Now, the Reserve Bank has a rule because in case there are deficits, the Reserve Bank is going to manage the borrowings of the government. And this can be long-term borrowing, it can be a short-term borrowing. In this budget, of course, emphasis on a 50-year loan has been given, but as you know, in the past, we have had loans, and when I took, when I joined the Reserve Bank of India, and I was the, in the debt management department as their research director, I was surprised to see that in India we had perpetuities, loans which had been taken, which had no end date. And that was not only unique to India, it's many places in the world this has happened. A 75-year loan is a norm in the World Bank. In our own country, 50-year loan was quite often uh, done. And of course, in this budget, we have announced a 50-year loan again. So, the budget is set in the context of what is happening domestically, and you have seen it before the budget. The election campaign was around employment, and that got reflected in the budget. And the budget is also trying to capture and encapsulate what is happening globally. So the global scene will also get captured here, and we're all in different places. It will get captured in diplomacy, it will get captured in defense expenditure, and also in external aid and foreign direct investment. So the budget, in a way, is a reflection of what is happening right now. And now just imagine exactly the example I gave you. I have taken admission in a graduate uh, study course. Five years I'll graduate, but during these five years, many things are going to happen in the family, the marriage, this, that, everything is happening. But I have to keep a study course and complete my degree. That's exactly what a budget is taking care of everything happening domestically, happening globally, but then we have an objective, we need to grow and we have to maintain a steady growth path. Why? We can raise the taxes as we want. There are standard rules that we can do so following those rules. And of course, these are time tested. And these four canons that I'm showing you are being, have been articulated more than 100 years ago by a public finance economist called Dalton. And this is, you have to be equitable. And everybody <coughs> should be able to pay tax to the, uh, related to the abilities of that pair uh, or the person. And there should be certainty. I should know beforehand how much are you going to tax me. It can't be that I earn an income and then you suddenly say you've done Oh, absolutely fabulous, now 50% belongs to me. You can't do that. There has to be certainty as to what's going to happen, how much you're going to tax me. Therefore, the budget is generally announced a few months before the year starts. It should be easy to pay the tax, and then cost of tax collection should not be more than the tax collected. And now you can immediately place your thoughts on agriculture income tax. Can agriculture be taxed with about 20 crore households spread across this continent-sized country? If I'm going to raise an army of tax collectors and land holding so small and agriculture prone to weather gods so exhaustively with 66% of agriculture even today dependent on weather, uh, should taxation be done on agriculture? Will the canon of economy really apply there and will it uh, succeed? So these are the four canons of taxation which has stood the test of time over years. And of course then other canons, the public economists have brought it up, that one of it is the canon of productivity. I should be able to raise as much amount as I can so that there's enough revenue to meet the expenditure. I should have multiple sources of raising taxes. So if there's one place there is a little dryness, I can cover up from the other. I should, it should be simple to understand and sometimes we all feel the tax laws are so complex, they're so difficult to understand and there should be flexibility, I should be able to revise it as and when required and then there should be elasticity that whenever the situation is changing, we are able to, I'm sorry for this. On expenditure also, Similarly, there are different rules and regulations. As far as effects of taxation and expenditure are concerned, I would like to mention that there are enough number of studies now globally done which say that taxation can impact your work, education, retirement, 
savings, investment, and risk taking, and I'm happy in the discussion time to go through all of them. But the most interesting part that you will see is the last bullet, marriage and divorce. And I didn't know this till I landed up for my PhD studies in Sydney, and I realized, oh, okay, you could give a tax incentive for people to stay married, because if you have a uh, tax income, taxable income, which is combined for the husband and wife, you could give a concession on it. And therefore, there's an incentive to stay married, and I was surprised. And of course, they also give incentives for childbearing. So these rules, these fiscal rules, can be used for behavioral changes in the, uh, in the culture of the country. One other example which I always like to share is, and that's happening now, but while I was doing my PhD on public debt in Sydney, I realized you could change the behavior of working population. And one of the easiest ways could be, and that came into effect in our country much later, one of the easiest ways could be you could say that, okay, I want more female labor force participation in the country. And by saying it won't happen because cultural values may not permit that. At the moment you say that if women enter the workforce and whatever they earn, they'll be total tax-free income, you suddenly find that family norms and cultural mores start becoming more accommodative and women start entering the workforce. Partial application of this law has been that one gives them higher standard deduction in our country or will probably give them a higher threshold income and then say taxes on women will apply from them. And, but this is something uh, very, very effective that taxation does. On expenditure, similarly, the story is on subsidies. And this word has suddenly become very abused. But then subsidies have been there for all times and in all countries, even today. And in subsidies, if you take it to the extreme, you can say, okay, I'm going to have an army of youth because I'm giving them such high subsidies, they need not work, they need not struggle, they need not really work hard to find a job because I'll take care of their food, I'll take care of their clothing, and I'll also take care of their house. On the other hand, if you have a very different system and you say nothing doing, you earn, you work hard, and then you eat what you earn, you eat from whatever you earn and can spend on type of a house or the clothing that you can afford. We have nothing to do providing you a conducive environment, a safe border, and a safe internal security. Everything you have to do on your own. So these are two sharp contrasts which happens. And one, of course, we all know in Russia what was happening a couple of decades ago, and then we know what happens in America. So these are two extremes. But even in America, you have subsidies even now. So subsidies have a very important role to play how they're used, and these fiscal instruments are extremely, extremely sensitive, and each one of them have a very different implication. Now expenditure is higher than my income. I'll have to borrow, and if I have to borrow, I'll run a deficit, and if I have accumulated deficits over years, obviously I'm going to accumulate debt. Now, where am I going to borrow from? If I'm going to borrow from, the Reserve Bank of India, for that matter, a central bank of the country, as economist, money supply goes up, and obviously, you will find it very inflationary. So therefore, should I recklessly borrow? Who all can borrow? So the role of interest rate becomes very important. We've just had a monetary policy announcement two days back. They've held the interest rate at a very high level. Fed has also held it at a very high level. And is that right or wrong? We can take, take that question in the discussion. But the point is, whom will you borrow from? And I'll come to that in a minute. But if you borrow from the central bank, it's going to be inflationary. Now, as, the, as far as the global <coughs> empirical rules are concerned, not theoretical, empirically, it has been found, and the, that has been very well articulated in the Maastricht Treaty on which Euro was made, that the prudent deficit limit which means expenditure more than the income. Prudent deficit limit is 3% of GDP, and prudent debt to GDP ratio is 60% of GDP. Now all these prudent limits are basically, I jokingly say, only for India. But if you look at the rest of the world, especially the countries in the Euro area, especially countries like Italy and Greece, 
they have, or even Poland sometimes, they have hardly met these rules and they have always got away with it. To me, the most fabulous and most underutilized use rule is the Doma rule. The Doma rule was first published in American Economic Review, a very celebrated economic journal by Mr. Domer, a very successful public policy expert, who said, well, if you can borrow at a rate which is lower than the return you get on the borrowing, it's worth it. For example, if I am able to buy a lorry at 8% rate of interest, but I can deploy the lorry to do business, which can get me a return of, say, 15%, and there's a margin of 7%, it is worth it. So that's all that the Doma rule said, and then the economist turned and twisted it all over and almost forgotten it. Now, I was talking just now about how do I finance it, my expenditure. I can finance it from the central bank, the top bullet, it will be inflationary. I can borrow from within the country. If I borrow from within the country, that means my savings are being used for the budget purposes. <laughs> Obviously, my own objective of either buying a car or a house is going to be delayed or deflected, and therefore it can crowd out private investment, and that's also going to be under some limit. I, you can't borrow too much from within from the citizens when the citizens are on an average not very rich and income inequalities are so wide. So therefore, there's inherent limit on this. Can I borrow from abroad? And, you know, this audience... Uh, borrowing from abroad always will have implications. Uh, any country that I borrow from most probably will first tell me to spend that borrowing within that country, so I'll have to do with whatever they have. And secondly, they'll tell me that I generally should follow the rules that they set up. For example, if they want to veto something in the United Nations, they'll expect me either to veto or abstain. So that has, again, implications. So I have limits on borrowings from abroad too. Increasing taxes. and We have just learned under the canons how much tax can I increase and on whom can I increase and to what extent can I increase. And when you are in elected government, it's becoming very, very difficult. Of course, there are indicators, and I'll give you some indicator in a minute from now on deficits, but we have to remember when deficit is incurred, there's a different inflation, and when it has to be returned, there's a different inflation. And inflation can have implications on exchange rates. So if I'm borrowing from abroad, it'll have a very different, different story. Now, yes, I have done deficits, but I've built assets. In any country, do we really take account of assets and liabilities? or we only take off a deficit as a liability and do not take into account assets. There could be, because we're in a habit of borrowing, there could be unaccounted liabilities which we are not really calculating. And once you're in a habit of it, and in our own country, guarantees are hardly documented. Finally, the business cycle. There could be different points of time you can be up on the business cycle and therefore you could be making more taxes than normal and you could be at the bottom of the business cycle and I'll show you the data in a minute, you probably will not be able to even raise enough taxes. So the business cycle should take care of deficits but these rules that I shared with you are simple 3% constant throughout the year, 60% constant and not worried about the business cycle and economic situations as you know we had COVID and during COVID should we have given more accommodation to these indicators. We had the Lehman Brothers and after Lehman Brothers we had a massive problem in the US. Should we have had a very accommodative policy at that time? Well, uh, the world did extend it but there were rating agencies on which many things depend really didn't bother to take that into account. So what is the bottom line of this theoretical story that I've just narrated to you? We have to be little careful with all these indicators, especially the deficit indicator. So then the question is, okay, deficit is a very big problem. <coughs> By the way, I must mention that is deficit a very big problem? Yes, the traditional view is it binds intergenerations. You are borrowing now, but your future generations will have to pay for it. And obviously when I speak about a perpetual loan, which has no end date, 
future and future and future generations will pay. If I speak about a 100-year loan, which was also quite prevalent in many economies, four generations later, they'll have to repay the principal amount. 50-year means two generations later we'll have to pay. So traditional view is a burden. It's intergenerational. But there's a Ricardian view. The Ricardian view says, well, you know, if you take a discounted value of all that, it's nothing else but present-day taxation. Because if you had to incur that expenditure right now, you would have to raise the tax manifold. And that would be a massive burden. But what you have done is you have just distributed it, but whatever said and done, the rational human being assumes that this borrowing is nothing else but in a way distributed lag model and it's a discounted value of future debt. Okay. So there are various other perspectives. Should we have a balanced budget or should we take care of the um, fiscal policy taking into account business cycles? And there is oh, fiscal policy can badly impact the monetary policy, so share, therefore should we have a restricted uh, budget and a restricted budget, uh, fiscal policy? And how about debt and politics? Then it becomes an instrument of discussion in all political campaigns. So should we just contain ourselves within the, ex uh, within the taxes that we can and not incur as much expenditure as is required at this point? And how about rating agencies? And how about other countries who are lending to us? And will they really harm us? Will they provide us opportunity to follow an independent fiscal policy? This was the theoretical construct that I've shared with you. And now next, for the next few minutes, I'm going to share some data with you. The data I'm going to share is coming straight from the budget. This will be more like a revision because you and me have read it in all newspapers and heard it in all TV channels. So next few slides are more like reminding you, uh, setting a contest before we start the discussion. So the budget says, and I think rightly so, there are vulnerable sections, four major groups, which is youth, farmers, women, and poor people. And I wrote to the government and I said, look, why are you forgetting elderly people? Youth is fine to begin with, but your fifth bullet after poor people should have been the elderly people. And why I say that is, Today in our country, we have 11 crore elderly people. 11 crore, which is not a small number. And these 11 crore people are far more financially responsible. Many of them have pensions or savings, and therefore they are an important component. But well, the government simply announced four major groups. And it said it's going to focus on employment, skilling, MSMEs, and middle class. Fine. But you know that employment, as I've told you right in the beginning, it's an obvious objective of a fiscal policy. And to create a good employment, you need people who are skilled. What is missing is healthy people. You can have skilled people, but if they are not able to come to the job every day, they have weak lungs or they have weak eyesight, you will not be able to produce at the best productive levels. That's why I said, to produce, to grow, you need good labor, you need good capital. And if labor is not effective, if labor is not healthy, you find it. So health should have been a very important factor in the focus areas. Well, they spoke about the nine priorities, and they said, and these are all obvious to all of us, agriculture has to be strengthened, employment once again, we need to take care of HR issues and social justice and financial inclusion, Industry has to play a role. Obviously, urbanization will take place and that has to be channeled. Energy security, basically non-renewable sources of energy are very, very important. Infrastructure in a country which has to grow, obviously, has to be also of that quality. We need to innovate to stay ahead. R&D is not really our cup of tea. And then we have to look at next generation reforms. So this is overall the budget profile, and I'm going to show you something. This you must have seen in the budget, where it comes from, and I'm going to go in detail here. This sort of just a summary here. Now, this is something which I want you to focus on. And the important thing that I want you to focus here is on this is all percentage of GDP. Now, in this percentage of GDP, you probably would have not noticed how the revenue receipts are performing. And 9.6%, which is being budgeted, is something, I think, excellent. Revenue expenditure, 
again should stay under control. Normally, the rule, the golden rule is there should be no deficit on the revenue account. I'm sure you know what the difference between revenue and capital is. Capital is long-term building assets which have long-term implications. Revenue is within this year. The easiest thing to remember, if it is salaries, it is revenue. If it is buying a car, it is capital. So here we are, the revenue receipts and revenue expenditure, and you have a revenue deficit, which is coming down, which I think is very, very positive. And when you look at the overall picture gross fiscal deficit, the technical jargon gross fiscal deficit is very simple to understand. Total expenditure minus revenue receipts. That's the technical. There could be little adjustments here and there. Those are minor adjustments. The major thing is total expenditure. That means revenue expenditure and capital expenditure minus revenue receipts. That's the thumb rule. That's the gross fiscal deficit. The good thing is the rating agencies all over the world, everybody is looking at the gross fiscal deficit. So you see the trajectory is downwards, which is, I think, a very positive trend. This is the slide which I want you to focus on. We all have seen in our country discussion on subsidy, subsidy, subsidy. You call it freebies, you call it ravery, whatever you call it. Subsidies has been a major point of contention, even diplomatically, under the Washington consensus between American policymakers, multilateral agencies, IMF and World Bank, and Indian policymakers. And I used to be sitting in the Reserve Bank, and we used to be fed up of this subsidy, 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 right? But the elephant in the room is not subsidy. The elephant in the room is interest payments. So total revenue expenditure is 11% of GDP. And out of that, 3.6% is preempted by interest payments. And that's why I gave you a lengthy story on deficits and debt. Something which is totally ignored by all policymakers and all scholars and students. It's not the subsidy, it is interest payments. And I think I'm the only one who wrote a paper while I was at IM Bangalore saying if private sector can renegotiate their interest rates, can the government do it? And if you can't renegotiate, you know, in the international arena it is renegotiated. Argentina has done it million times with the multilateral agencies. But if you can't do it, you can at least change the portfolio. And once we attempted, when I was a debt uh, director in the debt management of the Reserve Bank, we said, okay, those products, those outstanding loans which are not being traded in the market or they are not very liquid, can we just take them out of the balance sheet and come out with these young, younger loans, shorter duration, at a low rate, and change our portfolio? But all I'm trying to say is the countries, the scholars, the academicians have yet not applied their mind to the elephant in the room. And that's not a subsidy. Of course, if you look at from another angle, if out of 11.4%, I've just shown you three, if I take defense, if I take salaries and pension, internal security, you will find that actually the finance minister is left with a minuscule amount to really do the juggling. Most of it is committed expenditure. And when you look on the left side and look at the taxes, how much leeway do we really have? Now this is something which is going to really open our eyes. This is the central government. Even if I add states, I'll add 7% of GDP to it. In a nutshell, what I'm trying to tell you is tax to GDP ratio in our country is 17%. One seven. And you know what? We want to be like America. And what is the tax to GDP ratio in America? About 36%. How about Scandinavian countries? About 40% of GDP. That is why they can give you highways which look like runways. And that is why I can only make a highway which will look like a village road in America. I can't afford it because I don't pay taxes. And tax to GDP ratio is so low. 
Obviously, the question, and I'm sure you're going to ask me that during discussion, is, is the tax ratio low or is complying with the tax low? And obviously, our tax rates are as good as anywhere in the world, but compliance is something which is a sorry state. You must have read it. Everybody has spoken about it. I have written on it extensively, but more than me, the government has tom-tommed it everywhere that during this time, <coughs> capital expenditure, which means the quality of expenditure, has improved, and there's no doubt about it. Today, capital expenditure is 3.4% of GDP. The good thing is the credit here belongs to the government that during COVID time, rather than spill the money here and there, squander it away, they did it in a very phased manner. Capital expenditure has multiplier effect, exactly like me going to the restaurant and enjoying two beers, vis-a-vis -vis me saving to buy a car. So car is obviously going to give me much better results or me going and funding my degree abroad that's going to give me much better returns than my just going and spending, uh, squandering away money in a bar today. Okay. Now, these concepts, in a way, I have explained to you already, but here is the trend. And what is the trend? The important thing in the trend is the downward trend. That is something which we all have to agree that there was a time when we were not able to ensure fiscal discipline Right now, there are no, no off-budget um, things. Most of the things have been brought into the budget, and after bringing them into the budget, we find there's a downward trajectory, which is good. Of course, you would agree with me, this still doesn't meet the empirical gold standard of 3% of deficit to GDP, which is for the whole government. I'm only showing you for the central government, and that doesn't also tell you. Okay. Now, Given this long story, where do I stand globally? As you can see for yourself, I am not that bad off as a country. I started my talk by telling you we are an emerging country. Obviously, my expenditure is going to be more than my income. As a young man, my aspirations are more. So obviously, I'll take deficits. This will accumulate into debt. But if you look at my debt to GDP ratio, they are not that bad that one should be worried about. Where is the guys who have been pontificating to us all the time? We should look at their debt limits and see where they are. And therefore, I always say, look, this COVID, actually from the Lehman Brothers, the world has become flat. There are lessons from India for them to learn. And of course, there are lessons for us to learn from them. So there's a flat world. How about financing gap, which is the gross fiscal deficit? And this is center and state put together, and this is coming from the IMF. Again, you see, yes, we are little on the outlier, but then our inflation is not that bad if you see the figures, and I'll spend a second on that too in a minute from now. Okay, are these budget data rosy to win an election? Not really. What I've done is I've taken budget estimate, I've compared it with the actuals, and I find, okay, sometimes they're a little low, sometimes they're a little high, at some times they're really bad, but on an average, if you look, they are revolving around the actuals, so there's nothing to worry. This is the point I was trying to make to you. When we do not have enough taxes, we can't spend too much, and if we have to spend too much, we'll have to borrow, but if you look at the trend here, we, in a way, had to restrict our expenditure as a percentage of GDP, and you can look up the last two, three, uh, last two years data. And the last data is, of course, 23, 24, and 24, 25. So you can see that there is a declining trend, and now, of course, uh, that is something little worrisome. Here we are then on subsidies. When we needed it, subsidies were high, they were brought down in the years when we were comfortable. And again, they're picked up a little bit. This is in rupees trillion. But if you look at the ratio which I showed you earlier, subsidies is on a downtrend. Okay, now these are some, I just put it pedagogically in case there are any questions, but is it going to be increased growth and employment? Yes, on employment, they are experimenting with some different but unique ideas. And I would grant them that <laughs> 
at least they are thinking on those lines. Will it make a dent? You know in economics we talk of something called crowding in and crowding in means if the government incurs expenditure on setting up an airport, then the private sector jumps in by setting up hotels, providing taxi services, providing guides, and then it has a multiplier effect. While government can incur 100 rupee expenditure on setting up an airport, the private sector will put in 500 to then create an ecosystem around it. Similarly, I think an attempt is being made by them to sort of pump priming employment in the very unique type of schemes that they have announced over different uh, uh, areas, giving in giving the first salary or giving his first salary in different installments, I think they're experimenting it well. Now, growth. Will it lead to growth? This is the, this is the policy which has just been announced after the budget two days back. The growth projections by the Reserve Bank are really very, very positive. And this, are, this is the fan chart that they have for next one year. Is it inflationary? This is the fan chart which the Reserve Bank has come out just two days back, which shows it will not be inflationary. Rather, it shows that for the next year, our inflation is going to be 4.5%. Okay. Will it help agriculture in a special way? Some attempt has been made. This is in continuation. And I wouldn't say it's going to be really path-breaking. They did come out with agriculture laws, which, they, which backfired. So I think they are they are very cautious on what they're doing on agriculture. When it comes to manufacturing, again the same story I would say, they are attempting on the fringes, but probably the attempt is on uh, crowding in. Infrastructure, lots of it. Gati Shakti program onwards, they have been talking a lot about it. It's a continuation up here. Urban development, same thing. They're talking about cities, they're talking of developing the smart cities and all that, so it continues. Will it lead to export competitiveness? The PLI scheme really did matter a lot. And I think they have tried to reduce customs duty and attempting that it does uh, lead to some. Will the middle income be weakened? We know about the standard uh, deductions. To that extent, I think some care has been taken. Savings and investment, yes, if there is some benefit on the income, it should get channeled into savings and investment. On social justice, on the face, nothing special, but for the tribals, they have announced something. For the northeast, again, they have announced something. Next generation reforms, lots of it on R&D. They have spoken about space economy, I thought, I thought which was very good. Which has been perplexing we policymakers is land registry and land parcel identification number. In that sense, they have identified some. And this is now, I'm into my conclusions. How is all this going to take place? Neither in the priorities, nor the focus areas they spoke about the financial sector. But towards the end of the speech, and I'm very happy, we did have a financial sector um, overall assessment, how to go ahead under Narsimum 1 and Narsimum 2 about three decades ago. They have this time announced in the budget. So, if I have to conclude, I think it's in the direction of long-term growth because they have spoken about capital expenditure. Fiscal consolidation is on the track. Quality of expenditure is improving. And the budget is talking of Vixit Bharat 2047. At least all of us have started thinking of a 25-year horizon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Charan Singh, for that uh, extensive coverage. Uh, so it gives us a, a detailed backdrop on what we need to discuss. Uh, this will require a little bit of a modification of our time because we have to, but no problem. We'll, so we'll speak for half an hour and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, I think uh, the background made one thing very clear. You're looking at a steady growth moving into, uh, into employment and then into the uncertainties of the current government. In some sense, that's the det more detailed or current context in which the policies are being, policies are being worked out. 
Now, there are larger issues involved in some of these things. For instance, uh, this, uh, the, this budget sees a decline in subsidies. Uh, and uh, there is a, a question as to should that be the purpose of all budgets? At a time when you've had, including in neighboring countries, successful economies don't necessarily imply social acceptance. So is this trade-off something that is there? I thought what we could do is since you are uh, a part of eGrow, you're close to the government, you have a ringside view of government, let us say. So if we can get an insight of what you think and what you th think the government is thinking. Right? And I, I would think the budget is a good document. It normally is a good document, but, but this time all the more so because as today's papers tell us, the finance secretary is now going to be the cabinet secretary. So we are, it's a kind of a vindication of what the budget was trying to present. So if we can go with question by question, the first one is, do you think this focus on steady growth, you made the point earlier, but has, does it come at the cost of, uh, uh, at the cost of welfare? And is there, particularly in an election in which inequality has been a major issue, uh, at least rhetorically, do you think that is the way to, they could have gone, and, or is that a kind? That's a concern, or is that a consensus that's now unshakable? That uh, any uh, welfare element might be used in the election rallies, but when it comes to actual budget making, they'll dismiss it as a freebie or something like that. So, is that a reality we are going to deal with? It's a kind of schizophrenic kind of approach: one in politics and one in the budget. So let me. Let me share my thoughts on this income inequalities. And uh, I must share this with you. I was on a live telecast on a TV channel, and suddenly I do not know why the anchor decided to ask me a question on the recent wedding. And he said, how do you justify it? And this was so spontaneous that I wasn't prepared for an answer on this. And live telecast, not even recording. So I know this has been perplexing the minds of many people that in a country like ours, can somebody afford a lavish wedding and a wedding which would probably stand, set global standards? So income inequalities is a very, very big issue. And you are right. It started with freebie culture. And you have been writing, Professor, on it. And where did it all start? And did it start from South, uh, South India, one of the states? And then went over to other parts of the country. But I'll, I'll give you some raw thoughts. I've been myself thinking, as you know, the Western world is also full of income inequalities. And you know that uh, Picti has been writing a lot on it, and others have been working on it, and writing on income inequalities. When we were growing up, you and me studying in college, we used to hear about the trickle-down theory. So we'll have a rich man, he will uh, create jobs for others and everybody will be employed. So we all went through the trickle down theory. And I used to always think, and incidentally I used to work in the Reserve Bank in Bombay and we had the same common wall uh, between the Reserve Bank quarters in Kolaba and Sea Wind, which is the residence of Ambani's. And I'm talking of the time when Elder Ambani was still there. And we would see them in the garden and children would see how much of party they make and how much of sacrifice we make. I've seen all that. But my thoughts have always gone down to searching, can there be growth without income inequality? Can there be? No, I, I agree. That is, that, that is an issue. But I was yeah. just wondering in the sense that because you're talking about a decline in in the deficit, yes, right. The fiscal deficit has is has not dropped below the pre-COVID level, but the mm -hmm. but the revenue deficit has. Mm -hmm. But if that has been brought about by cutting subsidies, then there is a trade-off that is Absolutely. being made explicit. Absolutely. So, do you think that is a there's a consensus on it? This was done earlier in the Manmohan Singh years also. Right. So, is, do you think mm -hmm. that there is a consensus in government on that? which will not be shaken. So my own feeling is that there is one understanding, at least I think so, that income, income inequalities cannot be escaped. They are there. Fair enough. I'm going beyond that. I'm saying, do we need to spend, uh, do we need to spend on, uh, uh, on welfare 
you cannot remove income inequalities, yeah. but whether you need to spend on welfare or, or cutting, is cutting welfare a valid means of reducing the fiscal deficit? So on that aspect, my own view is a laser beamed approach. What this government has been attempting to do, and they take pride in it, and in my interaction with many of them over there is, while subsidies had been there earlier, and in one of the meetings I heard that very good term, that the flab is being removed. Now the targeted approach of subsidies, be it food, and they have already announced 80 crore people will get free food, and uh, the targeted approach that they follow, they believe is far more efficient than a general approach to freebies. So it's not a direct question the way you said trade-off, but it is certainly a view that income inequalities are here, they will probably stay. We have to take care of a certain segment of the society which is marginalized for many reasons. And for them, we have targeted approach in terms of food, which is important. During COVID, we had a similar targeted approach for the vaccines and the people who were not able to afford could still walk into a public hospital, government hospital, and get the vaccine done at no cost. So the targeted approach, in a way, then defeats uh, that trade-off question. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's not a simple black and white. To me, their understanding is on the, on the people who need it, they are getting it. The last point I would like to mention in this is the Jandhan Yojana. Once the Jandhan Yojana was brought in, the success has been really celebrated and discussed very much happily that the direct benefit transfers reach where they should reach, including the ones which they have started on the farmers, especially the marginal, marginalized so, farmers. How, how would you react to the idea that this government tends to celebrate inequality? And I, I'll put it this way. That's because if you look at it uh, in terms of differences and inequalities that exist, traditionally subsidies have been given to those who are losing or at the losing end of it. Here what we have for the first time in this budget, you're actually celebrating somebody who has got a job. You're saying the first time you get a job, the government will give you, I think, 15,000 up to a maximum of 50,000, 15,000, because you've got a job, which means you're not subsidizing the unemployed, you're subsidizing the employed. Right? It's a way of, of linking up with, I mean, it's like uh, a very traditional thing where you get a suite or you give a suite to a person when he gets his first job. But the government is doing that. It's also a way of identif government identifying with private sector employment so that it doesn't have to give the jobs itself. Now, this I'm, I'm seeing it as a part of a larger trend simply because the government seems to be uh, looking at income differences and trying to project it as an aspiration. The I government has now changed the nomenclature for backward districts into aspirational districts. So the idea is that if I traditionally you would see income difference as an inequality and therefore you help the poor. Now we are saying I see it as an aspiration. I celebrate those who are benefiting from that difference, including the people who get their first job as a first step towards doing that. Now, uh, this is a, is a fundamental change in the way we look at income differences. Is that something that uh, is, it, it has come only from this government, but you think it will survive it? It'll, or will that become the new norm? See, my own personal opinion is, and I totally agree with you, that they, they in a way, um, encourage you, aspire you to pick up a job, to make yourself job worthy that you are in a position, now once you are capable of getting a job, here, I'll incentivize the private sector to provide you the job. So I think to that extent, it is like a, you hand hold and suck up and say, prime, prime, uh, pump prime the system and say, okay, work hard. If, you are, if the private sector thinks you're worthy of a job, here we are going to ensure that they give you the job. I think that's a very positive way of looking at it and very positive way to encourage people to come and search for a job, prepare themselves for a job. It basically comes from, if you remember Narayan Murthy saying that two third of the engineers are unemployable or something like that. Now if they are unemployable, 
That means if the institution is not prepared them, they have to probably prepare themselves and come up to the expectation of the private sector. One thing more I would, I would like to mention while I was at IIM Bangalore, in 2016 I wrote extensively, at the end of the day, given the teeming millions that we have in the country, and we have about one crore people entering workforce, that time the calculation was one crore, now they say it is not one crore, it's a little less than that how many people are entering the workforce. And I was wondering, I come from the army backgrounds, how much can army really provide recruitment? How much can police, how much can civil services provide jobs? Then I said, look, this uh, uh, anti-private sector sentiment should go away. Because at the end of the day, the private sector will provide you the jobs. Now, in case the private sector has to provide you the jobs, private sector's clear indication is the bottom line. Now, why will they be incentivized to take care of something like a social justice, which of course public sector banks do, private don't, but why will the private sector provide you jobs just for the sake of social justice? So I think in this scheme, they have done two things. One is they've incentivized the private sector and said, come on, you have some social responsibility, and it is something like the crowding in, let me pump prime you, let me give you an incentive to take this guy, and they've told the young people, that look, make yourself worthy of a job. To that extent, both the private sector and the youth have been told to upskill themselves, update them. So that's how yeah, I uh, interpreted this scheme. Because this acceptance of inequality is now extended into the taxation system itself. Traditionally, we were told in, in textbook economics that you uh, focus on direct taxes because that's what is progressive. You charge a higher rate for the richer people and not an indirect taxes which is uh, on everybody, even, whereas what we are doing now is you have had a massive uh, impact on GST, right? Uh, GST is now bigger than corporation taxes in this budget, I think, for the first time. It'll, it'll, it, it'll give you more revenue than the corporation tax. And if you do that, you are now saying anybody who buys a commodity, irrespective of his economic status, has to pay the same tax. Now, you might say that you're going to control it by looking at the types of commodities different people buy. But uh, if you take, for instance, servicing of a car, you pay a tax of 28% GST on that. Now, if that holds whether it's my car, your car, or the car of a taxi driver, it's, it's the same. So it is an unequal thing, and that's an acceptance of that. Now, you, the reason I ask this is it's not just this government, but that comes from the GST council. So are we into a new consensus where it does not matter and that we are, even the fiscal system is now going to become one where uh, there is an inequality built into that system itself? So, you know, if you and me go back into public finance in India, remember Nicholas Calder came and told us the type of country that you have, probably indirect tax will be better, right? That, that was 50s when he came and told us. Now, when they did the demonetization, I was invited by IMF to come and make a presentation. So I had to really dig deep and look what this is because very soon it became a very abused word because everybody knew that something has gone wrong here. I looked at demonetization. The first case of demonetization happened before independence. 1935, the Reserve Bank is made. They come out with 5,000, 10,000 notes at that sure. time. And the first demonetization took place in 1945 because they found that the tax revenue to Her Majesty's service has gone down. They realized, what have we done? So sure. demonetized. So the tax evasion and avoidance has been so rampant in the country that we have come out one after the other schemes to somehow revamp it. It has not changed. Special bearer bonds, which was a turning point, but never changed. So then the issue is, that in case we are, we are so successful and so innovative in avoiding taxes, you need to incur, uh, you need to meet the expenditure. And uh, indirect taxes, fortunately, uh, have served the purpose. So the GST also, if you remember, and of course... But the inequality of it wouldn't bother the government or current policy makers. So, so the GST was first thought of, VAT came much earlier in the 80s, Congress was in power, the GST was conceived by the Congress, which is, to extend, they are the ones who brought the mixed yes, economy, the socialist. It's a, it's so there was a consensus. consensus on GST that was emerging, 
and then of course when it got implemented it was this regime in power so then the issue is if it is this regime in power there is a continuity in the concept of indirect taxes. absolutely so i'm let's say i'm saying where are we going where are we headed we'll come to the specific governments afterwards but where are we headed because another aspect that we see in the same kind of thing is in the attitude to the capital gains tax the idea of capital gains tax earlier so far has been that you tax the profit over and above inflation right so the indexation was built into it now that indexation has been removed the rate has been brought down now but that's at the edge of the wedge next time the rate will go up so the point really is that uh, you are now saying that the burden of inflation will go to the person who's getting capital gains it is not going to be discounted right so what i'm saying is that various stages there is of thinking about the budget which is itself fundamentally being altered and i agree with you it's not uh, i mean it, we, too much of the budget is analyzed in terms of one party versus the other so we don't get this we don't capture the longer term trends but this is a longer term trend but where does that thinking take us because i'll give you one more example if i may and that is really on the question of capex like you you have cut down your revenue deficit but your overall deficit hasn't fallen as much largely for, primarily because you're investing heavily in capital expenditure that's excellent in theory but uh, what is the kind of infrastructure choices that are being made are they consistent with what happens on the, on the ground i'll give one like for instance a major part of indian labor now uses short term migration that is they stay in their village and then come to the city work for a few months and go back and uh, this is a very large number as we saw in covid at the covid time the, the such short term migrants are very large in number and uh, but the railway system first of all you emphasize road expressways rather than railways because you're trying to uh, be comparable to the best in the world so you shifted your resources there and within the railways you are emphasizing higher end trains now this system is beginning to collapse because anybody who travels in the railways now will tell you that even if you get a confirmed second ac ticket people will barge in the system is beginning to collapse now you're putting more and more second ac compartments and people are barging in all over this and there is no effort to address this mm. so this is a kind of disconnect where I, i agree with you there is more of a consensus it's not just one party doing something there is more of a consensus but is that consensus itself coming under pressure i totally agree on this aspect of yours is there an um, absorption capacity and is it in the right direction so you have spoken about the roads uh, i was speaking to one of the professors today morning well the roads are being built four lanes five lanes but are they drivable i go from delhi to chandigarh often and one of those days and i'm giving you my personal experience i was thinking if i was drive i'll use it the time for making my powerpoint but i couldn't because the road is there but is it drivable so yes sometimes i think the infrastructure is being emphasized but the quality of infrastructure firstly what type of infrastructure what is the priority on the infrastructure and what is the quality of infrastructure which is being built i think that needs to be evaluated and on that i'm not very sure uh, whether we are in the right direction where are we in the right direction i think the new airports which are coming up that i think is a good idea and um, be it the ref uh, refurbishing of the uh, places where existing airports were doing well like bangalore or where uh, or we are setting up new airports i think that's something very good that's happening some tunnels are being made which i think is good but now i'll tell you the caveat there i'm very worried about what is happening in uttarakhand while the chardham is being developed but unfortunately the climatic changes and the natural disasters that are happening in the last few years are so many that it compels one one to think should that pace of infrastructure in uh, uttarakhand be done so that's why i totally concede with that point of yours that are the priorities really thought through <laughs> and is the infrastructure it's needed we all know it is needed but the way it is being built or the way it is being pushed 
is there an absorption capacity and is it meeting the standards with which we thought it's being built? The Uttarakhand example is, a, is an interesting one because it also points to another aspect of government policy today and that is the centralization. I think people in Uttarakhand recognize what is happening but they really have no sense in it. And even in this budget, you, you look at it, for instance, the Finance Commission, they say has their grants have, have uh, been less, but have been actually cut compared to last year. And the uh, centrally sponsored schemes are actually 45,000 crores more than what it was last year. There's, the effort is to control even local schemes from the center. So you will end up in problems like Wayanad or Uttarakhand because they are really not things that will be recognized very easily or cannot be standardized. If I use a standardized process across the country. So th that emphasis on excessive control, maybe there's a lack of trust about the states or maybe it is anything else. It, it is reflected in the policy on states as well. Because in the states, in a coalition government which you started your presentation with, the, you are expected to make concessions and I think the Chief Ministers Nitish Kumar or Chandra Babu Naidu wanted packages. They have not got packages. But they've got more centrally sponsored schemes in their states. Yeah. Now, what does that do for actual understanding of what's happening in the... Uh, does it help sen sensitivity? And I think you pointed to Uttarakhand and I would add why not to that. But both of them are, are extreme cases of things. But there are, even at a lower level, you will not... I remember when MGNREGA came in, Karnataka had to fight to get sericulture as an accepted thing because it didn't exist elsewhere in the country. So any centralized schemes are not sensitive to local requirements. But... Uh, since you have been on the sideline of the government or sort of ringside view of the government, is this a deeply held view that will not change? So now let me uh, see one disadvantage of being in a policy circle for too long, too long a period, is you have seen many sides and you have seen many governments and you have seen different governments doing different things. You see, when the planning commission was there, everybody and all of us thought everything is so super centralized. Planning Commission decides where what will be done, where the dam will come up, where uh, the city will develop, right? And then we all, all people who were a little critical of the government then, and I used to be one of them, saying there's too much of central planning. Why should the states not have the freedom to decide where I, do I need a Hirakot dam? If I need, I'll put money. Who are you to come and put money here? And uh, who are you to decide that my city should develop or not? Whatever. Now, I was very happy when the planning commission was done away. I said, okay, this will make a decentralized planning. But then uh, Niti Yoga, as you know, doesn't really dispense expenditure control and all that. But when it comes to thought processes and thought dissemination, again, the states have... To my surprise, I would have thought that the states would come out with their own Niti Ayogs, which will be so competitive, which will say, this is the priority of my state. <coughs> Actually, uh, this, and I articulated this, and I wrote in one of the newspapers saying, when you talk of a $5 trillion economy, this is five years back, how are you going to attain it? Centralized? Or will it be state by state? Every state will say, look, Okay, we have an aggregate picture of 5 trillion, but I want to go from this to this, and here is my plan, and I'll snatch that plan. And if you can't give me resources as a central government, I will raise resources from wherever I can, but I will achieve that target. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. So, centralized versus, non de versus decentralized. Again, it's a problem of absorption capacity. Why have the states? And in this, it doesn't matter who's in the power in the state. Is it the BJP government or the Congress government? None of the state governments have come out with their own plan. That, okay, if you have a 2047 plan, Vixit Bharat, here is my plan for Vixit state. None of them. Irrespective of which is the chief minister, which party is in the government. To that extent, I am really worried which model works best in our country, decentralized or centralized. Is it that we lack experts? That even 
for certain activities, economic activities, we have people who are not experts in that area, but they are heading it. Is it that we lack experts in our country? Many times I have seen both the governments, they had to hire experts from outside the country to run important institutions in this country, both the governments. So therefore I say, uh, when you have been into policy making for a long duration and you've watched them in the Reserve Bank, I joined them in 1984. I've watched all that that was happening and critically evaluating it because I used to be in and out doing my PhD back, doing my postdoctorate back, watching it. Now also I'm watching it and I feel that um, within our country and how do, whom to tell, how to tell that everybody will have to rise to the occasion. I must, Professor, share one thought with you. I'll take one minute of yours. I was at IIM Bangalore in 2016 when a Japanese delegation came to CIA Delhi. They invited me to be part of the Indian delegation. So I told them, look, I'm sitting in Bangalore for Indian delegation. You can have many people from Delhi. Why do you want a man to come from IIM Bangalore? Nevertheless, they took me there. I went there and the Japanese delegation is talking about their development plan. Their delegation had one professor who was about 83 years old. And I was at that point of time about 55. After the major deliberations happened, the professor quickly asked me, he said, uh, Professor Singh, are you ready for, a five, for an advanced economy status? I said, yes, I'm ready. Means I thought, how have you to be ready? You're ready all the time, you know. Then he looked at me and said, sorry, Professor Singh, you are not ready. Then he asked me, if the economy has to become a $5 trillion economy, are you ready for a $5 trillion economy? Now it's scaling down from advanced country to a $5 trillion. I said, of course, that's not a question. We are all ready. He said, no, Professor, you are not ready. To be ready to become a $5 trillion economy, your strategy, your thinking, your conduct, your body language, everything will change. And he said, the $5 trillion economy will first happen in the minds of professors of your country. From there, it will travel to the public and to the students. And then you will become a $5 trillion economy. That is when I wrote that if you want to become an advanced economy, we all, state by state, individual by individual, industry by industry, <coughs> will have to make a plan. Now let me ask you one question. We have all read about Viksit Bharat. We have been hearing about it for so many years. Has any study been done under Viksit Bharat, what will be the need of fertilizers? What will be the need of steel, iron and steel? What will be the need of electronic industry? Anybody? Under Viksit Bharat, what will be the position of Karnataka and Haryana and Bihar? Any study done? No. So therefore, I think uh, the professors have to come in and think that, okay, if we all nurse a dream, we have to translate it into paper. And no one else better than professors can articulate the roadmap. No one else better than professors. But across the country, I get invited uh, to deliver keynote addresses at Indian Economic Association. There are three of them. I have always asked them, do you have a plan for Viksit Bharat? None. Politicians are not going to make Viksit Bharat. Industrialists are uh, chasing their bottom line. They are not interested in Viksit Bharat. If they can import uh, uh, viscose fiber from Bangladesh at no price, do you think they are going to say, we are Bharti, we will produce it here? No way. Industrialists, transport, car manufacturers, nobody. But we professors have a role. And I think we professors have to rise to the occasion. Start writing. From each state, if there is a plan for Viksit Bharat 2047, then only we will be able to achieve it. Okay. On that note, I think we'll go to the audience. Uh, any questions? I think there will be a mic, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, last few years, we have seen the government is not able to fulfill its disinvestment target. 
while the stock market boom is there and everybody is happy making money, why government has not been able to fulfill its target? I'll tell you a very funny answer to that. In, in 1997, I came back from finishing my PhD abroad. And I was made the director research in charge of fiscal policy in our country in the Reserve Bank of India. I had heard about disinvestment while, you know the story started from 93 onwards, they started talking about it. In 97, now I was the director of research. They gave me a plan. Here are the Navratnas. Tell us the sale price at what we can now privatize it and disinvest. Nine, nine Navratnas were placed before me. These are the industries we want to disinvest. Please tell us at what rate should we disinvest. I had just come back from a PhD and I thought I am the smartest man in the Reserve Bank and I struggled and I went to Government of India. That time there was a different uh, government, now is a different. I went, spoke to them. They said, this task has been assigned to you, do it. You come out with an idea, we will work on it. We failed. I could not come out with a benchmark price on which this investment should take place. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. Moment you touch it, what, whatever price you determine, you are bound to go wrong. LIC had this plan recently. I think 970 was the price fixed, minimum price. It opened for a very long time at 600 rupees. Everybody blamed that you have priced it wrong. How much time it took for it to come to that base price. So the point I'm making is, for a long time, we have been struggling with this investment. For a long time, from 1993 onwards. I'm not, in this case, not a ringside. I was into it and I knew the challenges. We have not been able to some attempts have been made, you know, Air India. Some attempt has been made. There are pros and cons up there also. But it is too difficult a task. So on this, I don't blame anyone, neither the Congress government. They failed miserably. All their budgets had lofty figures and actuals were very different. There's 10 years, same thing I'm seeing here. These are difficult things. I'll tell you another difficult thing. Again, which, in which I was involved and I know the inside story. Corporate debt, the bond market, corporate bond market. Patel committee, who was a don in the stock market, he made recommendations. We have not been able to achieve it even now. So there are very perplexing issues on which there are very difficult things to handle. Yes. I don't think I'll need one. Uh, my question is very simple. My question is very simple. I have seen the industry, private sector, you rightly said, Professor, that it is the private sector which has to provide employment. Government cannot pro provide employment to teeming millions as you have termed it. I had seen the change coming in, in 1991. And I'm wondering, with that background, before that was Maruti, for example, with these backgrounds, why Make in India didn't catch? catch? Why production link uh, incentive is not caught on? Because all these were supposed to be giving a boost for private investment in the industry. What has gone wrong and what has to be done? I, I now personally feel that this employment uh, linked to scheme may also not click. There's something basically wrong. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Many things didn't click. The lofty, but this is the most important one. But Sorry let, me share, you. let me share some thoughts with you. Firstly, and I'm not going to dwell on depth on this because I have written papers. You can Google and see the details. But I'm going to dwell on the second point, which I'm now, the first point I'm going to say is the lofty ideals of demonetization. Somebody who had worked in public finance for 40 <coughs> years, my PhD, my MPhil, my PhD, my postdoctorate on fiscal. But tax evidence and tax evasion is rampant. 
and committee after committee if you remember our age vanchu committee yes, yes what statistics they gave yes. and national institute of public finance policy right. estimates 50 right. to 60% of the country unaccounted and then the special bearer bonds of 78 what happened so the lofty ideals for demonetization did we meet them no we beat it right I now mean, the issue that i want to come to and i want to dwell on it and i wrote on it with what happened in china in covid was that not a golden opportunity for india to grab do you know in 78 there was no foreign company operating in china 1978 in 2019 just before covid 9 lakh 60000 come i've written on it and google and seen the newspaper the articles on it numerous 9 lakh 60000 companies foreign companies operating in china and all of them are fed up of china what could we have done we could have easily easily and i'll give you how we could have done it at least attracted them on indian soil vietnam did it estonia did it bangladesh did it and we didn't so i went and studied what is that attracts people to china and i have written on it you can look at the detail but let me give you a nutshell they make your life so easy to come and operate in produce in china the tax incentives the export incentives are so high that if it costs you 1 rupee to produce they compensate you to the extent of 1 rupee 67 paisa right why are foreign companies flocking despite all the bad name that china has despite the western world against china why are they not pulling out because nobody else is giving them an equivalent terms of conditions now with our embassies if we deploy them to promote exports which they did a good job despite the global slowdown we achieved record level exports last year happening because of a good work of embassies similarly if we are able to provide same terms and conditions and a little more why can't we really help northeast virgin lands lying there so i think you are right there are golden opportunities coming our way and we are letting them go coca cola the way it went out and the way it came back yes we have opportunities i think that is why i am saying viksit bharat 47 will not happen until we all have a road map in our mind and who will lead it i think the academic world will lead thank you for your talk uh, i want to go back to one of your slides where you spoke about the debt burden uh uh it does appear that we are fairly decent in the debt ratio while the more developed economies the us uh and almost japan is the exception 260% of gdp uh there are numbers about china that go up to about 300% if you include their municipal bonds and their local regional debt as well is it possible for india to adopt a similar chinese strategy because if we, if building on what you were just saying right now that if we are supposed to give them incentives foreign companies or private sector companies indian companies let's let's even the playing field right we give everybody the incentive you create jobs you create employment we'll give you for every 1 rupee if we can't give you 167 we'll give you 150 but that means somewhere that money has to come from is the china path of, of high debt and that in could include lot of local debt is that a viable option for india i think it's a very relevant question especially after the little dialogue that we have had do we have the resources to squander the way china did it but you will have to watch the china model little more carefully what they did from 78 so i'll spend a minute or two on it 78 they started reforms which we started in 93 onwards right by that time they were absolutely way ahead of us what did they do 
It's a very clever strategy they followed, Professor. I don't know if you've seen it, but at the IMF, I noticed it and I was stunned. It is an Indian strategy. They, and please forgive me if I'm going to use an example, it'll drive home the point directly. When India was run by kings, some towns and some villages were very smart. They said the best way to ensure safety of my town is to have a queen married to the king. Moment there is the queen in the, in the palace, my town is safe, right? And therefore, kings would have many queens and for what reasons we all understand. But one of the incentive for the city used to be that my city will be safe. Now the king will attack anyone else but defend me because I come from the queen's city. What the Chinese did? The Chinese development model simply was accumulate US dollars. In 2012, and this started from 2003 onwards, basically the Chinese learned after the Asian crisis. If you look at the foreign exchange reserves of China, till Asian crisis, nothing. After Asian crisis, they started building, before we started building. They started building after the Asian crisis, reserves like crazy. I was doing my reserves, international reserves evaluation at the IMF in 2009. Total foreign exchange reserves worldwide, 10 trillion. China, singular country, holding 4 trillion. Now you try to trouble China, China will say, here are, I'm going to download all your trillions and your exchange rate will go under the drain. That is how, quote unquote, China blackmails others. Right? We Indians will never be able to do Neither can we, and there were theories. How did they build $4 trillion? One is exports the way I told you. One rupee spending on production, 167 your compensation. The second is exchange rate. And if you look at the way they manipulated their exchange rate, the numerous studies Google and see, but everywhere on a multilateral board they are sitting, they will say, if you talk about our exchange rate, we will not let anyone enter our country. And multilateral agencies had to withdraw and say, okay, we will not talk of exchange rate. They built their reserves. Once they built their reserves, they were able to get away with all this. We have time for That's one basically. last uh, sh short yeah, question. Sure. Okay. You talked about senior citizens. Is it fair? You put your money in a bank, she taxes you. You withdraw the same money of your hard earnings for 50 years, she taxes you. And then she tells you GST is, you know, growing. Mm -hmm. Can you escape GST? You can't. So is she fair? And the second thing is, why are we resisting the wealth tax? Uh, why is India refusing to get, get into that? So I'm with you on that. both of it. I'm myself a senior citizen. And I've written on it. And I've written extensively on it. I'm saying that the senior citizens are your best asset. They're your best asset. You give them 100 rupees as pension, say senior citizen pension, they're not going to go to the bar. That's the best utility of old age allowance or unemployment allowance. They are going to either put it on their son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter. That's exactly what you want, demand sustenance. So you have to, and look at other countries, how they take care of their senior citizens. They deserve to be taken care. I'm totally with you. Uh, I'm Professor, your emphasis was on income inequalities. And I think wealth tax is rightly in order. Why should it not be done? And I think we all as economists or policy makers should build up a case for both. Senior citizens, which of course serves my case, I don't have wealth, so I don't care, wealth tax or not. But in general, I agree that once I'm gone, why can't you have inheritance tax? Okay, on that note, thank you, Professor Charan Singh, for a extensive discussion of the budget and for on the issues that go with it and thank you all for being here